Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. Here's your host, Chris Lee. Commodore fans, on your feet, it's time to anchor down. Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast presented by Dr. Jody Jones DDS. We're part of the 440 Sports Network. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today, Joey Dwyer. Joey is going to be heading up our hoops coverage this year at Vandy Sports. We're going to talk to him about the extension that Vanderbilt gave Jerry Stackhouse. We'll do a comparison with his peers, and we'll get into our annual minutes forecast, which has been a popular segment on the podcast in years past. Joey will appear on the guest line that is presented by Michael Kendrick of the Kendrick Group. Michael is a local carpenter and a lifelong Vandy fan. He builds bookshelves, cabinets, picture frames, furniture, and made-to-order items, including a display case for my Dale Murphy jersey, which is right behind me in the corner, and it looks phenomenal. I've seen Michael's work. Obviously, he's a true craftsman. If you're in the market for custom woodwork, give Michael a call. That number is 630 95, excuse me, 9458. Now on to our interview with Joey Dwyer. Joey Dwyer joins us. Joey, of course, our new basketball writer and podcaster at Vandy Sports. Joey, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, for sure. Wanted to come on the podcast uh, because my rivals account isn't fully set up. So I wanted to get my thoughts out somehow because the articles are in limbo at the moment. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get that fixed. It's been a busy week, uh, <laughs> but thank you for the reminder. But, um, well, I mean, and yeah. it, this is actually probably better to talk through anyway. We're going to do two mm-hmm. things today. We're going to talk about projected minutes for the coming season. But before we do that, we will talk about the pertinent news item that is Vanderbilt extending the contract of Jerry Stackhouse. I've, I've got some Stats of things to get into to kind of break down where the program is and some comparisons that I think are interesting. But what were your thoughts when you heard the news that Jerry Stackhouse was getting his contract extended for an undetermined period of time, at least as it was announced? Yeah, the undetermined amount of time thing was a little interesting, but I was a little surprised. It wasn't a no-brainer extension, kind of like a Brad Underwood or a Scott Drew would be, but... I certainly don't think it's an awful move. There's arguments for both sides. Obviously, Vanderbilt isn't the easiest job, and Jerry Stackhouse uh, inherited it in a pretty brutal place. But uh, has kind of turned the program around a little bit. Obviously, hasn't made the tournament and uh, has only had, I believe, one season above 500. But uh, seems to have this thing going in the right direction, and I'll get more into that in a little bit after you give some of your thoughts. But um, I think it's it's an extension that didn't, overly surprised me but it's not one that i was thinking hey this is a no-brainer it's got to be you got to lock jerry stackhouse up but i think he's done an okay job and seems to have this thing going in the right direction at the moment we'll see how this season goes yeah the timing was odd he had three years left on his deal Uh, the next two years in my mind very important and sort of absolutely I, i think giving more of the verdict on what kind of coach he is. To, to me, the jury was out. Uh, somebody I know that, that has contacts in coaching and athletics just said that they thought the timing was odd. Uh, I think the question was, were they bidding against anybody? In other words, was were they threatened that Jerry Stackhouse was going to go somewhere else? I've got a couple of connections in the NBA. I ran that by them both after the extension, uh, both of them – gave me kind of a resounding no. They did not think that was a threat. Um, I think if Jerry Stackles was going to leave, I think another college job is unlikely. I think the most likely would be the NBA, and it would not be for an assistant's job. I don't think it would be for a head coach's job. And from what I hear, there just isn't a lot of demand for him in the NBA. Now, look, if you want to argue – that it's recruiting and and the coach needs security. Um, fine, I can hear that. I still think it was premature. But if folks were wondering, and I'm not telling you this is the absolute truth, but what I am hearing initially is that the NBA was not perceived as a threat here, at least right now. In other words, if there were some, well, I guess nobody would be calling for him right now because the NBA season has started. 
But point point is, I think that that that's the perception of what they were bidding against. But I don't see that as a real threat, given what I have heard. For sure, I don't know that it was that they were bidding against the NBA in that sense. Kind of like you said, obviously had the G League job, seemed to impress some people with that. But I don't know if he's a top tier NBA candidate at the moment. Kind of like you were saying, but. Not going to find many better X's and O's guys in college basketball. His player development track record's been pretty solid. So I guess he's probably one of the more intriguing college coaches in that aspect. But I wouldn't say he's a top-tier NBA candidate at the moment. I think you kind of believe the same thing. Yeah, we, we do. And I, I do think his player development has been fair. Uh, I think my bigger question is his his recruiting uh, because you can only bring in you know players with, with so high of a ceiling um, – at least what he's done so far. And so he's gotten, look, he's been to one NIT. So there is that. I mean, and that is a far cry from where they were. His record, okay, if you want to look at where they were when he took the job, the year before they were 9 and 23, of course, went 0 for 18 in the SEC. And that was Bryce Drew's last team for which he got fired. Um, they finished 155 in Ken Palm. Jerry's first year here, he goes 11 and 21. Uh, three and fifteen in the league finishes one sixty nine in Ken Palm, of course. Aaron Neesmith, who was really coming along nicely, got hurt and missed the entire conference season. So there was that. The next year they went nine and sixteen, three and thirteen in the league, one hundred four in Ken Palm. That was the COVID year that was weird for everybody. Last year nineteen and seventeen, seven and eleven in the league, sixty four in Ken Palm. So a pretty good rise there. Uh, average Ken Palm rank is 64, so that there w- there was certainly some progress. I want you to react to that before I compare him uh, to what I think are three valid comparisons. Yeah, it's it's not the most appealing resume, obviously, but like I said earlier, it seems to have this thing trending upward. Uh, this year is going to be a big year, like you said earlier. Obviously, it's just to prove that it wasn't just a Scottie Pippen Jr. thing. It's more of Jerry Stackhouse having this program uh, with some stability and uh, I think that does help or the extension does help that in terms of stability for recruiting like you said but obviously it's not that long of a extension I don't think it would go through any of his current commits high school or college careers so that argument is it foolproof but uh, it seems like this thing is trending positively just kind of based off those numbers and where he inherited the program from obviously it's not ideal for anyone um, this kind of boosts the morale around the program. Now you just got to prove it on the floor. You have to win. And uh, this is a huge year for Jerry Stackhouse and his team. Yeah, overall record 39 and 54, 13 and 39 in the SEC. Uh, so that's that's the tally on Jerry Stackhouse. Okay, there were three other coaches that came into the SEC at the same time. I will give you the tally on each of those guys. First is Buzz Williams, who has had – one of one of the strangest <laughs> three year sample sizes for a coach I remember. Buzz Williams comes into a program that the year before he gets it, Billy Kennedy goes fourteen and eighteen, six and twelve in the SEC, ninety one in Ken Palm. Um, first year sixteen and fourteen, ten and eight in the league. Somehow ten and eight in the league got him one thirty one in Ken Palm. Uh, that that's bizarre. The, the next yeah, year very. they barely play. They go eight and ten. They go two and eight in the SEC. One thirty seven in Ken Palm. Last year they go twenty seven and thirteen. Finish runner up in the SEC. Nine and nine in the regular season in the SEC. Thirty three overall in Ken Palm. That team got royally screwed for the NCAA tournament. <laughs> Not only should it have been in, it should have been in as like a ten. Uh, I, I did a lot of research on that. That was one of the major gaffes the NCAA has had in recent years. I think, frankly, what what the committee did was it got lazy and it didn't consider anything from about Friday on. But anyway, uh, that's mm-hmm. another story. Another coach who came in at the same time, and by the way, the, the final tally on Buzz Williams, 51-37, and 21-25 and 25 in the league, average Ken Palm rank of 100 in that tenure. So it's weird. Uh, he he goes twenty one and twenty five in the league, with an average rank of Ken Palm 
of 100. Stackhouse goes in that same time 13 and 39 in the league with an average Ken Palm rank of 84. Again, like I said, Buzz Williams has had a – it's just been a bizarre career though there so far. Okay, another coach who came in at the same time, Eric Musselman. Under Mike Anderson, the Razorbacks were 18 and 16, 8 and 10 the year before um, – Musselman came in. Anderson was fired for that. That team went 54 in Ken Palm. First year, 20 and 12 overall, 7 11 in the SEC, 47 in Ken Palm. Uh, again, that the COVID year. Next year, 25 and 7, 13 and 4 overall, 18 in Ken Palm. Last year, 28 and 9, 13 and 5 overall, 18 in Ken Palm. Back to back elite eight. So Eric Musselman is 73 and 28. 33 and 20 um, in the conference and 28 overall in, in Ken Palm. And as an aside, um, from what I am told, uh, Vanderbilt had a pretty good shot at Eric Musselman at the time, uh, but Malcolm Turner was not interested. Okay, last one. Nate Oates, the year before Nate Oates gets to Alabama. Avery Johnson goes 18 and 16 overall, 8 and 10 in the league, Ken Palm rank of 64. First year they go 16 and 15, 8 and 10 in the league, 60 in Ken Palm. Next year is 26 and 7, 16 and 2 in the SEC, won the SEC championship, 9 in Ken Palm last year, 19 and 14, 9 and 9, 28 in Ken Palm, and a first round exit, making for 61 and 36. 33 and 21 in the league and an average rank of 32. Uh, that is a mouthful, but those are the other three coaches who came in at the same time to the SEC that Jerry Stackhouse did. Absolutely. Those uh, those coaches, I think, have all been uh, more successful than Stack by at least a decent margin. I think the Buzz Williams comp is one that's interesting. Obviously, much different jobs, Texas A&M. Uh, less academics to worry about, more of NIL backing. But I do think it is comparable in a sense because they're both guys who have tried to build an identity around their program, around defense, and just putting pressure on other teams. And I think Stack, uh, whatever you're going to say about him, I think he has done a nice job building an identity around this program. Uh, and it didn't seem that, that they had much of one um, in the year they went to own SEC, 18 in SEC play. Um, so I think that's a step, but obviously not as big of a step as a guy like Eric, Eric Musselman has uh, taken to where his team is a preseason top 10 consensus team, and Alabama has one of the best backcourts in the in the league and in the country. So obviously much different jobs, but I do think those three coaches have been much more successful than Stack, but I think Stack has, um, Stack has made do with what he's had. Uh, obviously hasn't been that successful compared to those guys, though. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens from here on out. I mean, this this should be – I don't know if this will be his best team yet. I, I think there's a debate between that and last season. But – and let me find this. I think they are ranked about in Ken Palm where they ended last season. Let's see. Yeah, last year they were 64 in Ken Palm. This now year they are – 66. So, um, yeah, Ken Palm sees them as the same team, basically, although they are going to be minus Scotty Pippen. And by the way, this will be Stackhouse's first team that is completely composed of players that, that the other staff had nothing to do with getting here. And that's why it's such an important year for him, just because it's finally his proving time. It's This is your team. You have to prove that you can handle the SEC and you can recruit an SEC level, and we're going to see if Jerry Stackhouse can do that to an extent this year. I don't think this is uh, an 100% assessment of Jerry Stackhouse. I think we have to take in the full body of work, and the recruiting classes after this are pretty solid as well, but this team is going to tell us a lot about Jerry Stackhouse and uh, the identity he's built around the program and um, just the recruiting level that he's been at. Is it as good of, Is it good enough to be a competitive team in the SEC we're going to see without Scotty Pippen Jr. Well, uh, th the next question is, uh, who's he going to do it with? Um, and we do this as an annual exercise. This will be your first attempt at it. This is the minutes mm -hmm. forecast, uh, which I think has been a, a popular podcast with the listeners. 
It's kind of interesting to put together. Uh, my experience, and I think this was yours too, is you always forecast more minutes <laughs> than are available in your first draft of these things, and you have to go, well, goodness, I'm going to have to to cut time from this guy here and that guy there, and then, then you come up with your list. So we have both done our list. Are, are we ready to go through this? Yeah, this one is a lot different than uh, what I've experienced in the past with Mike Bray and Notre Dame. You knew you had seven guys, <laughs> right. and you knew who those seven guys were in June. Jerry Stackhouse, a lot different stylistically, and uh, makes it a lot more fun for me. I have a lot more to debate about with you than I would have uh, had we been covering Notre Dame basketball. Yeah, yeah, lots lots here to um, bite off. In fact, I'm trying to decide. I, th- I think I'm going to do this. And, and I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here. Hopefully you can sort your list either mentally or with the computer. I, I want to go and just see who you've got in every – well, I, I think here's how I'm going to do it, okay? I think I want to go who leads the team in minutes, get your take on that, and then I'll tell you mine, and we'll start comparing minutes for each guy and just, just see where we – agree and differ um again in, in the past it's been a fascinating exercise and uh, i don't know why it wouldn't be again this year so with that who do you have leading the team in minutes this year i have jordan wright leading the team in minutes with 32 minutes okay i have jordan wright leading the team in minutes with 29 i am going to because and, and by the way for the audience's benefit we we did not do any comparison uh ahead of time we did not. so so we have no idea what the other one is going to say so you're going to give right i'm going to i'm going to make a column and just make sure your math is correct along with mine and see where our biggest differences are um so again you've got right for 32 and i got him for 29 um your we'll next see. highest guy go ahead i'm sorry We'll see how much Algebra 1 has taught me with uh, my math ability. <laughs> see, you just you just get a spreadsheet to do all this for you. I'm, I'm, I'm setting this up as, as I figure it out so it does the math for me. But um, I made a tier. I'll get on your level next year. <laughs> that, that may or may not be a good thing. But in any case, um, <laughs> hang on two seconds. All right. Give me your number two in minutes played. I have Ezra Manjon with 30. Vanderbilt has had, in the past few years, two guys eclipsing 30 minutes a game. Uh, and my two are Jordan Wright and Ezra Manjon. I think uh, he's going to have to be a heavy minutes guy for them. He's not, uh, he's not saving Lee. I don't think he's Scotty Pippen Jr., but uh, he's going to be really important to how Vanderbilt runs this team. Averaged 34 minutes a game last year at UC Davis, so has proven that he can play for extended periods of time, which I was a little concerned about, frankly, just because of how hard he plays um, and just how how active he is. But um, I think Ezra Manjohn is going to have to be a workhorse for them. He's going to have to guard defensively, lead them defensively, and just run them through the offense. And it's going to be challenging if he can't be on the court for around 30 minutes. Yeah, okay. My prediction was Ezra Manjohn would be second on the team in minutes. Um, I've got him with 28. Uh, th- kind of the baselines of expectations. Pippen played 33.1 a year ago. I don't think he'll play quite as many. Um, and Manjohn played what at, at UC Davis last year? Like I want to say it was 33 or 34. He's played a ton of minutes out there. Yeah, 34 minutes a game last year. Yeah. I am thinking, and, and this tips my hand a little bit, that just there's there's a lot of guys on this team that have some ability. Uh, how much they have, we'll, we'll wait and see. But I'm I'm projecting he's got some guys he's going to need to give some minutes to. And so I was a little more conservative with Wright and Manjohn than you were. Okay, no, number three, this is where it gets tricky. Who did you have next in minutes played and how many? There was a big drop off from um, Man John to the next guy, and this one is one I'm still a little worried about having as my third, just because of the injury history. And by that, I'm assuming you can guess it's Liam Robbins. If Liam Robbins can stay on the floor for this year and can hold up physically, 
he's probably Vanderbilt's second or third best player. I, I'm not super confident that he can play 25 minutes a night, but if he's healthy, they're going to need that out of him, uh, even though they have another experience big. So your projection is 20 or 25, excuse me. 25. Yeah. I went that with 20. The day. 20. I'm sorry. That prediction changed probably two or three times throughout the day. That was the one I <laughs> had maybe the hardest time putting down. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm I'll I'll tell you what I did here. I I put him at 20 because I've got him splitting time with Melora Brown. I gave him both 20 minutes because I think they're mostly going to be on the floor apart from each other. That was maybe a, a chicken cop out or whatever you want to call it, but that's how I arrived at, at that figure. I actually did the same thing. I have uh, Melora Brown at 15 minutes a game. I just think the ceiling is so much higher with Robbins, and ideally, yeah. ideally you're getting 25 a game out of Robbins. And he's a little bit more versatile than QMB is, so I think I'm a little higher on Robbins' minutes than you are, but I'm not. I'm not dying on that hill by any means. You know, I suspect you're more right on that than I am, um, but because you're right, he's a more talented player. I mean, Stack played Malore Brown 24.3 minutes a year ago. I think that health probably figures into that a little bit. Um, maybe foul trouble. I'm, I'm, in fact, while I'm doing this, I'm going to look at fouls because I don't know the answer. Um, Robbins drew 35 fouls last year in 274 minutes. Melora Brown drew 92 in 873. So, um, yeah, I think Robbins a little more foul prone. Like I said, I think you were probably more right about that than I am, but I, I put 20 for each of them. That's actually a great point about foul trouble because I think ideally – You'd want Robbins on the floor for 25 minutes, but yeah, I don't know how realistic that is just because of the foul trouble. There's so many bigs in the SEC who can bait you into fouls, like guys like Oscar Shibwe, I can't Colin Castleton, guys like that who can just get to the line essentially anytime they want against a smaller guy. That's well, small is used relative there. Liam Robbins is seven one and has a decent build, but. Uh, not the Oscar Sheboy type build. So they're going to need two bigs to play consistent minutes. And I think we both agree on that for sure, that they're both going to have to play significant minutes for them to hold up down low. And uh, there's also a third guy we'll talk about later, I assume, that may be in, there, in the mix there a little bit. Yeah, we, we will get to that guy later. Um, I'll put it this way. It's going to be a better season for Vanderbilt basketball if you are closer to right, then I'm closer to right. Absolutely. Okay, next. I've Well, let me see. Who have you got next in minutes played? I have Studi with 24 minutes a game. Same as he had last year. Yeah, I've got Studi. I also had him with 20 minutes a game. So I had three guys there, each getting 20. Again, that was a little bit of a cop out with the mystery elsewhere, but uh, so so far, you, I got a lot more minutes to come than you do. Um, so we'll we'll see we'll see how slim your bench is going to be, Joey. I got the Mike Bray philosophy, not fully, but uh, it's <laughs> right. been over. So Mike Bray would be very proud of me. All right, sixth in minutes would be who? I have a tie between. Colin Smith and uh, Lawrence at 23 okay. minutes a game. I'm close. I've got Lawrence next at 17. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I, he's going to so, have to play big minutes regardless. Well, and I think he's a stack favorite. We'll see I how that pans out. Mm -hmm. For sure. Where'd you have Colin Smith? <sighs> I've got him at 14. Mm -hmm. And you've got him at how wow. many? I have 23. Just because 23. It, he was one of the harder ones to gauge for me just because Studi wasn't at the overseas tour. I believe he was yeah. injured. So S Smith started it. So I I don't really have a gauge on how much Studi's going to play versus Smith at the four or maybe even at the three. Yeah. And next you've got who? 
I have kind of going to that next tier. Um, I had QMB with 15, which we mentioned, and then Emmanuel and Song with 14 minutes a game. 14 is exactly what I had. Perfect. So I had the starting six kind of, obviously it's five, but I think there's six guys who's going to play starting minutes, Ezra, Jordan Wright, Lawrence, Studi, Smith, Robbins, and then I think there's two other guys who are locks for the rotation, QMB and Ansong, and then past this it gets real interesting in mine uh, with fringe rotational guys, guys who will be situational players. Uh, I just think that he's got seven locked, and then a few guys with things still to prove that we'll have to prove them in non-conference play. Yeah, I think you and I are, are seeing the same thing. We've got the same top seven. My number eight at 11 minutes a game is Noah Shelby. What have you got there? I have Trey Thomas with 12 minutes a game. I think he's going to get the first crack at the backup point guard reps. I think Shelby is more of a straight-up two. Well, I think he's more talented than Thomas. Um, I just don't see where the minutes come from for him if he's not able to make reads or not able to improve his handle, which I'm not 100% sure he'll be able to do. I think Lewis is probably a better option in that class to be the straight-up point guard. Uh, and I think that's probably who will end up as their number two if he can make reads and get him through the offense, which Stack has really liked. But Thomas, I think, gets the first crack at it. Uh, I then have Lewis tied with him at 12 minutes a game okay i only had lewis at two minutes and you may be closer to that than i was because you you saw the overseas tour uh that's why i was Mm -hmm. doing football practice how many did you have shelby with i had shelby with 10 minutes a game just because i think he's too talented to keep off the floor just because the shot plays so much i think the athleticism's there for an sec guard it's just hard for me to find where he gets minutes because I don't know if he's a true point guard. And I think that's kind of what Vanderbilt needs just because of their lack of creation on the outside. Okay, so you've got Shelby at 10. I had him at 11. Malik Dia, you've got doing what? That's where mine gets interesting. I think uh, maybe I should have consulted with you a little more on this before because I'm not sure the redshirt history, but Malik Dia kind of shows the blueprint of a red shirt in my mind it's a guy who is extremely talented stack has talked about but stack also mentioned that like he's not polished yet he doesn't really know the system too well i think the exact quote was he doesn't know how to play yet which obviously is an exaggeration but i thought malik dia was a big that for a red shirt year just so they can kind of bring him along a little bit slower um so i don't have really any minutes there which is probably what kind of screws it up yeah, I put him down for 10, but I'm with you. I don't I don't have any idea what that looks like because, yeah, it, it did sound developmental, but he also said most talented kid on your on our team. And, like, sometimes you see kids that are playing five minutes in in November and they're playing 25 in, in March that are, that are young. So that, that was sort of my split the difference. Uh, but you mm-hmm. you may end up being right on that. I don't know. I have I have no read on what they get from him. I do think he's playable. That's the thing. It's just that they have so many guys who can play the four. You have uh, Studi who could probably slide down to the four. Colin Smith can play the four, and that's probably his primary position. Liam Robbins can slide down there if they want to play the two bigs together. And Song, only six four, but has a ton of length, can play there in a smaller lineup. Um, I think Malik D is playable at the four. I wouldn't be overly shocked if he ends up kind of following the trajectory that you mentioned where he starts out with a not many minutes and then kind of develops into maybe a fringe rotation guy. But I don't know. It's going to be real interesting for me. Okay, and you've got Dort with how many? I've got him at seven and a half. This season of the Vandy Sports Podcast has been made possible by my friend Dr. Jody Jones, DDS, When it comes to general or cosmetic dentistry services, Jody is the best in Nashville. Just check out his client list. It testifies to that. He sees movie stars, music stars, athletes, coaches, you name it. Jody is the dentist of choice for stars in Nashville, but he sees regular folks like you and I as well. What people love about Jody's office is the ambiance. It's relaxing. It's friendly. 
Someone described it to me as a tooth spa. Whether your needs are general or cosmetic, go see Jody today. Call him 615-270-2322. See him at 55 Music Square East, not far from downtown or the Vanderbilt campus. Jody is a former Vanderbilt football player and a huge Commodore booster, so go and talk Vandy sports with him while you're there. Go see Jody Jones today. Thank him for his support of this podcast because without it, this season would not be possible. Um, I have eight minutes for Dort. I just think the two okay. veteran bigs ahead of him will eat up a lot of those minutes. Uh, but I do think Dort can be really useful, and I think it was a nice add for them as a freshman just because uh, – not super immobile on your feet, as you mentioned when you went to that practice. I think you you noticed that as well. Not just a uh, bang down low guy. He can move on the perimeter a little bit. And uh, I think will be very useful when you see a Florida or a Kentucky or an Arkansas who have kind of those bruiser type bigs down low that can really make you pay if you don't have the guys who can keep up with them physically. I think Dort is kind of a... Um, Dort's more of a situational type guy to me than a straight rotation player, which is why I have eight minutes, more of a guy you can throw in there, tell him to defend, use some of his fouls, and um, rebound. But I do think there is a role for him uh, in that aspect. Maybe they want to play the long game with him. I wouldn't fully expect a redshirt there. I think it's maybe possible, but um, that's one of the more interesting ones for me as well. All right, we got a problem, my friend. Um Am I over? <laughs> yeah, if I've, I'm adding this in a sheet, and either I've put something down wrong. I'm going to read off the minutes you've got. Right 32, Man John 30, Studi 24, QMB 15, Robbins 25, Lawrence 23, Amsong 14, Colin Smith 23, Noah Shelby 10, Dia, you've got red shirting, Thomas 12, Dort 8, and Lewis 12. Okay, now technically you could be right because somebody gets hurt. You see the individual averages go over 200, although that was not the condition of the exercise. So either you're thinking Vandy's going to be playing an overnight or, excuse me, an overtime game every night out, or we got to cut some minutes here. We do have to cut some minutes, I believe. We have <laughs> be a lot of overtimes. <laughs> yes. I would look like a genius. You would. That that would be. Uh, I, I don't know what the uh, the Vegas odds on that would be, but if you're confident about that, then we need to we need to have a talk here <laughs> off podcast. Um, okay. In all seriousness, yeah. Well, that's that's why I do it because otherwise I go over. Okay. Um, d- do you just cut ten percent across the board roughly, or do you, do you start making cuts into certain players here? How do you handle? I think it? I have to make decision in terms of the backup point guard okay and i'm not i'm not fully sure where that comes in maybe paul lewis just because i don't know how much creation ability there is there i know he can run him through the offense but he's a freshman i think stack probably wants to play more with trey thomas his vet who he kind of knows what he's going to get from um paul lewis i think is a nice candidate to get some minutes there maybe i'll cut him down a few to however i can make the rotation work and then maybe cut one or two from Noah Shelby as well. Okay, you got twenty eight minutes to cut, so you tell me how to slice them here. I have that many? Oh my gosh. That many. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think may we take some from Tyron Lawrence. We're at twenty three. Okay. I think we go year seventeen. Okay. Tyron Lawrence. Um may we go Put Paul Lewis somewhere around eight. Okay. Noah Shelby, probably closer to six or eight as well. And then Lee Dort, I'd probably put at four, just because he'll be he'll be more of a situational guy rather than a guy who's getting consistent playing time. Maybe Lewis or Shelby is a guy who can consistently be a back end rotation guy if they can beat out Thomas. Okay, you're still eleven over. Okay, let's see. Probably take some away from Colin Smith and Studi as well. Okay, Smith Tell probably me how closer. Many. To seven. Smith probably closer to that seventeen as well, and then Studi go down to nineteen, so we're even there. 
Okay, so here's what we've got. I've got Wright with 29 minutes. You've got him with 32. I've got Manjohn at 28. You've got him at 30. I've got Studi at 20. You've got him at 19. Quentin Malore Brown, I've got 20. You've got 15. Robbins, I've got 20. You've got 25. Tyron Lawrence, we both have 17. And Song, we both have 14. Colin Smith, I've got 14. You've got 17. Noah Shelby, I've got 11. You've got 7. Dia, I've got 10. You've got none. Uh, Trey Thomas, I've... Go ahead. I have a few for Dort. I think I have four. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I've got... You've got four for Dort. I've got him seven and a half. Um... No, you're you're fine on minutes now. You you've you've made your cuts. Perfect. So where where are we uneasy now that we've done this? The backup point guard is where I'm a little yeah. uneasy because I think ideally those freshmen get more minutes than I have them getting. Because I think yeah. I believe believe more in those guys as guys who can run the offense than Thomas. But I do think Thomas starts the season with that job to lose. And also I think he's a little more versatile than a uh, Paul Lewis is because he can play both spots. Noah Shelby, I think can be serviceable at both spots, but is clearly better as a two. So it's just hard for me to kind of get those guys in the mix, even though I do think they're a bit more talented than Trey Thomas. Yeah, no. And I'm the same way. And by the way, that practices are not open. So we, it's hard to go and know what they're thinking, but the, the, the deal one is, is interesting. Um, you know, the red shirt was not something I would have conceived, uh, but I think your reasoning on that is is solid, reading between the lines of, of Stack's comments. Uh, I don't know where that's going to go, and, and I'm with you. Like, I don't know what they do with the minutes between Thomas and Lewis and uh, and Shelby, and, and frankly, for that matter, even, even maybe Lawrence, although his role is a little different. But uh, that's what makes the season fun. Yeah, it's just so hard with Shelby because you know he's talented enough to get minutes, and you know the shot plays, you know he's quick enough. It's just I don't know that he can be a true one for them, and I don't know where the minutes come from otherwise. So it's really tough kind of in that aspect because he's certainly talented enough. It's just does he fill the role they need him to fill as a freshman? Yeah. Um, Let's get into the mailbag. That is sponsored by Sutherland & Belk, a family-owned injury law firm. If you or a loved one has been hurt in an accident, give Taylor or Russell a call. That number 615-846-6200. See what your rights are and if they can help. All right, we've got about about 10 minutes to go through this before I've got to jump on another podcast. Um, I will answer this one myself. What details were released regarding the extension? Uh, Depending on the buyout, the extension may not mean much. The answer to that is nothing was released publicly. I, I'm pretty confident I can find out privately, uh, but that's that's our answer for today. That is a, it's tough when they don't disclose stuff like that. I'm glad I have a more or less insider like you, yourself uh, with me on this, though. Yeah, that, that it takes a while to get at those things. But um, anyway, okay, Ann Arbor Door says, Sounds like there's some scrimmage with Xavier, scrimmages with Xavier and Georgia Tech. We never get a lot of info on these, but is there anything you can share and do you expect to get info? Uh, again, I'll answer this one. Um, there's there's a decent chance I can find out what happened, but yeah, you're right. That's those are those are hard to get info on, and and actually that was I had not heard the opponents yet, so uh, that that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, next one from Ann Arbor Door. Any injury updates? Sounds like Studi was hurt for the European trip, and sounds like Robbins may not be one hundred percent. I think that's accurate. Um, you know, when when I was at practice, goodness, I think Robbins was out there, and I don't remember about Studi, but I I don't know anything to indicate they're going to miss significant time at the start of the year, unless I've missed something. No, I think. I think they're both probably close to full go. I haven't been in the practices, obviously, but uh, it seems like Stackhouse is pretty confident that both of them will be good to go on opening night. Okay, there was a question from Frida's boss about Dia and Smith. I think we hit them in the rundown, 
But if you've got anything mm-hmm. to add here, have at it. Uh, I'll just go over each of them a little bit. Colin Smith, obviously highly re- regarded recruit, a guy who a couple people see as a pro prospect just because of his length, can step out and shoot it and plays a translatable role. I uh, think the upside is there, but maybe not quite as high as Malik Dia, who Stackhouse says is the most talented guy on the team, obviously. This guy who at 6'8 has a lot of floor game, um, is physical, uh, can shoot it. A lot to like with Malik Dia. I'm not sure how much Stackhouse thinks uh, he's ready, but it's a guy who is certainly one to keep tabs on and who could be a really nice player down the line. Smith's the guy who's going to play more early, like we talked about earlier in the show. Um, but I do think um, Dia has a ton of upside, and Smith also has a lot of upside. Those might be the two guys in the class with the most upside, to be completely honest with you. Okay, the next one, and this will be the last one. This comes from WKU Door. Who wins the season over opener with Memphis? Uh, Ken Palm has got this as a one point game in Memphis's mm-hmm. favor. What's your take here? I think it's going to take Memphis a little bit to get going. I think Memphis is certainly more talented. Vanderbilt, I think, is going to keep themselves in this game, though, just because they want to overwhelm Memphis. And Vanderbilt is not an easy team to play on opening night just because they're a team that's going to attack you out of ball screens. If they're playing the two older bigs, they're going to hedge on essentially everything most likely. Memphis does have experienced guards like Hendrick Davis, though, who uh, some national media people have rated as a top 10 player in college basketball. Memphis has some nice pieces. Uh, It's not as daunting on paper as last year's team, uh, which did almost make NCAA tournament run uh, if they had beat Gonzaga. But this Memphis team is solid. It's not a no-brainer top 25 solid team, but I think it's a team Vandy can compete with. I don't think the talent level is quite there, uh, or I don't think Vanderbilt quite has the talent that uh, Memphis has, but it's one of those games that they're going to keep themselves in, and they have to hit shots to win. Um, They're going to have to keep their head above water. Defensively uh, is where they're going to stay within this game, but I do think Memphis probably finds a way to win this game, even though it is the opener, uh, tough game on the road against a team who has an identity already at this point in the year, and I think that's really important. Thoughts? We'll call this the uh, the Keontae Kennedy Classic. Yes. <laughs> that, that is that's going to be interesting. That is the biggest storyline. Yeah, what a storyline. Yeah, the, the, the what might it have been, uh, which would have made minutes even tougher. But anyway, uh, Joey, thank you for joining us today. I know we're going to be doing these Thank throughout you. the season. Tell folks where they can find you on Twitter. Uh, my at on Twitter is Joey underscore DWY. Uh, that's my personal where I'll be tweeting all the Vandy stuff. And uh, hopefully next year I will be able to get the minutes on the first try. I was way over this year. <laughs> uh, I was kind of sketching it out in class and I guess uh, had a slight oversight. But uh, hopefully was able to give some good analysis uh, even through that, I think. We kind of did a nice job talking about each player and kind of what their role will be. I think the tier thing was also really helpful. Maybe we can incorporate that next year as well. Yeah, all right. Hey, n- number one, rookie mistake. And, and number two, let's hope your professors were not listening. Uh, I'm not going to tell them. So, I, Yeah, you know, bro, you probably know a few of them. I, I think I probably do. <laughs> all right. Yeah, let's not let's who those professors are. <laughs> all right. All right, Joey, thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you again Oh, if not next week, then the week after. Probably will be next week, actually, because we've got a, a bye week after football. Uh, the season is about two and a half weeks out from starting, and so it's it'll be here before we know it. Can't wait. Looking forward to it. Thank you for listening to today's episode. We thank our presenting sponsor, Jody Jones DDS. We thank our other sponsors, Sutherland and Belk and MyPerfectFranchise.net. If you're interested in sponsoring this podcast, and that's how we make this work, please email me at chrisley 70 at gmail.com. We also ask that you subscribe to our website, VandySports.com. That is $99 a year. You get things there that you don't get here. And, of course, please rate, review, and subscribe where you see our podcast. That helps us get noticed. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at VandySports.com. Follow me at ChrisLee70. 
And finally, subscribe to our Vandy Sports YouTube channel as well. Thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast, which is part of the 440 Network. I'm your host, Chris Lee. We'll catch you with another episode coming very soon.